and I vow to Phaetum that the Takata's true meaning. All right, this is where we are in the Amida Sutra, in the native directions. We have moved on to the, uh, we finished with the Lion Buddha, and we're now moving on to the renowned Buddha. <coughs> so, re renowned Buddha, according to uh, Master Chinkong, uh, represents uh, heavens and human beings with the ability to differentiate between right and wrong. So, I ex extracted this from uh, Sanshu Xinian, one of the lectures from um, Master Ching Kong, Tamta Heinim, where he said um, the renowned the eyes in the eyes of heavens and uh, beings in the uh, heavens and the uh, human realms with the ability to differentiate between good and bad, wrong and right, um, skillful and unskillful. So to be able to differentiate wrong and right, essentially it would motivate you to cultivate karma, skillful karma. And so what, uh, that's what we'd like to talk to, about today is cultivating skillful karma. In cultivating skillful karma, when we talk about karma, we, it's, not everybody can accept that karma concept. They may see the cause and effect, but when you talk about, when you use the word karma, they don't really believe in it. And for those who believe in merit cultivation, it's those who believe in sins and merits. And when they have such faith, thinking that their sins and their merits in what we do, and when they have that faith, then it's likely that they're going to avoid bad karma, bad actions, bad deeds. Uh, bad, you know, unskillful speech, and they'll more likely to perform skillful karma. And because of their performance in merit cultivation and earning the, the karmic rewards that in the, in the karmic rewards that it brings them happiness. On the other hand, those who don't have uh, the understanding of the principles of Dharma they believe that happiness resides in money and, and materials, the, the, the physical possessions. So, because they don't believe in the law of cause and effect, they put all of their energy to, uh, in, in making money. So they put in their best effort to save up a lot of money, to accumulate a lot of wealth and their possessions. And because they believe that happiness and security is proportional to the size of the bank account and the amount of their possessions. So therefore, a person who does not understand the Dharma will constantly chase after money for security, for happiness. So, but on the other hand, a person who understands the Dharma, understands the principles, understands the importance of merit cultivation, they will pay more attention on performing good deeds, skillful deeds. So why is this so? Because a person who understands this principle knows that after they pass on this life is not the end. But it, it, his consciousness will go on, and after he passes away from this life, he, he knows that he cannot take his wealth, his positions, his material possessions with him. And, and then but the, the only thing that he can take with him are his sins and his merits. Just like in the Dhammapada uh, by Venerable uh, Sarada Mahadero, he had this illustration. Two, uh, on, on two accounts. The first verse is talking about the consequence of uh, evil actions. That essentially, when we perform an evil action, and when conditions come to fruition, there is no way from escaping suffering, just like the, the ox. It's followed by the cart. So whatever that, wherever the ox goes, the cart follows. On the other hand, when a person who does, who performs skillful deeds when he's alive, his happiness goes with them just like the shadow following the person. So no matter where he goes, happiness follows him. So a person who understands the law of cause and effect understands that what he can take with him are his merits. 
and any sins performed when conditions are right, suffering will occur. So then it's only after death that they will realize the impacts of their own sins and merits. But because normally when people are on a normal basis, when people are alive, they don't pay much attention. They don't care much about merit cultivation. But when they're in the spirit realms, they will realize that the sins that they have created will bring them sufferings beyond word. So it is only at this time that they realize the importance of merits cultivation or through food. When they realize, when they realize that, and they're in the spirit world, they're facing a lot of suffering. Um, their hunger, their thirst cannot. There is no way for them to alleviate the suffering of hunger and thirst, and there is no one or nowhere for them to to dwell to to relieve the suffering. That they realize the importance of merit cultivation. Um, as a spirit, they may not have a place to stay. They wander from place to place, maybe a tree, a bush here and there, to find a place to dwell. But if they are, if they lack merit, and that tree is already occupied by a bigger spirit, then they are likely to be chased away or face the abuse. In the spirit realm, even though they don't have the physical body, but they still have the five aggregates, the feelings, aggregates, right? They, they, can, they can still feel, and they can still feel the sufferings of cold, hot, hunger, and, and thirst. And so even though they don't have the physical body, but there is still feeling and because of the five aggregates, the they can still have that feeling, and therefore there is suffering, pain, and pleasure. So these are examples of those who have left this world with deficit merits. They don't have enough merits when they leave this world. In the uh, Dhammapada, um, there is a story about uh, boa constrictor, pedagogues. Pedago is ngawi, uh, ugly, right? So uh, a, a boa constrictor, uh, uh, no, these, um, the, these animals, they capture their prey and they squeeze their prey until their prey suffocate, and then they feed on their, their prey. So, so just because a, a person is in the spirit realm and we don't see the body doesn't mean that they don't face suffering. So here's an example where uh, Venerable Magalana uh, Mukingling, he uh, saw in his vision of this 25 league, very long boa constrictor burning in flame. And, and then he smiled but then another venerable asked him, and he said, well, when it's time, I will tell you why I smile. And then the Buddha says that when he was reaching enlightenment uh, under the Bodhi tree, he saw the same boa constrictor. And it was still in flame. Um, but as you can see, and then the Buddha uh, told the disciples the causes for the suffering, and it was because of due to his evil uh, deeds when he was alive as a human being. So, so there are many examples of those whose eyes cannot see, but we rely on the Buddhas, the stories from the Sutra, to help us understand the world that we cannot see, the spirit world. Right? I remember uh, in a, 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 a conversation with a group of people, and there was one lady who, uh, who retold a story about her friend who was a very wealthy business woman. She owned a gold and diamond store, so she was very wealthy. And when she died in a hospital, she, she was rushed into a mortuary in her hospital gown, leaving all her millions of dollars behind, all her precious possessions. And she did not even get a, a formal, a proper send off. They just rushed her to the mortuary uh, to, to be buried or to, to be cremated. But when this business woman was alive, she was very, she was a shrewd business woman. She would take advantage of those uh, for personal gain. And she didn't care whether it was a precious 
um, family gift, but in that dealing, that, that, that person did not pay back whatever it is on time, she would not let them have their personal possessions back. So in the, in, in the business dealing, she had the upper hands and she would take advantage of those who did not have enough money to pay her when she loaned them money. So she was not very compassionate, should we say. So when she died in the hospital, all the millions that she made, she left all behind. And the only thing that went with her was the hospital gown. That was the only thing that went with her. But this person uh, told um, about her friend um, in a group conversation, and she said that she had dreams of this businesswoman who was her friend, where this woman appeared in her dreams several times in her uh, hospital gowns, very hungry, very thirsty, begging, asking for help. And she felt so disturbed about this dream, which occurred in many, many times. So she went to consult uh, other people and she was advised to make some offerings to her friends and to do good deeds for her friend. So after that, she did not have any dreams of her friends anymore. So even though a person who is no longer living without a physical body, there is still suffering because there are still the five aggregates. Right there are still the five aggregates. When she was alive, if, assuming the story that um, it could be just a dream only, but based on what we know of the spirit world that there could be suffering, there can be suffering, there can be joy. The, the woman was suffering, even though she, she was um, without the body, she was still suffering. So only at that point she realized that she really needed help, her friend's help. But when she was alive, she didn't want to help anybody. She didn't realize the importance of helping other people. She went to her friend. Maybe her friend was nice to her when she was young, who he, she could trust, she could rely on, that who could uh, care to help her. So when we're alive, we understand this. We should put in our best effort to cultivate merits. So this way, we don't put ourselves in those situations. Right? So cultivate merits, when a person is alive, when he passes away, he will still at least have a place to dwell. His spirits will place, have a place to dwell. If he is good to, uh, if he, when he was alive, he was good to his family, good to his friends, then perhaps his family may establish an altar, no bàn cung, a cung chùa, to make offerings to him. And for those who made even greater contributions to society, then the country may erect a big monument to honor him for people to come to pay their, uh, um, their respect and the tributes. But if those beings, those in the spirit of ghosts have attachment, like Jepju, uh, then they will continue to dwell in those, uh, in those places to continue to enjoy the, suffer, uh, the offerings of others. But we don't have to talk away, talk too far into the uh, the spirit realm. Just now, right? Once we learn that we from other people that people who are in their elderly age, in the old age, and they look back and they said uh, when they're in misery and they look back and they wish they had done something better. Maybe get a an education or raise a family or be nice to the uh, the, uh, the their families and so forth. Um, are supposed to be in solitude or alone in suffering. And they'll realize that they should have done that as opposed to indulging in meaningless entertainment, right? wasting precious time and energy when they were young. And so it's only when they get to that point in suffering where they realize that the importance of merit cultivation, the importance of helping other people, the importance of sharing a helping hand when other people need help. And it's only at that point that they will realize the importance of their karmic rewards. Fu bao, no, fu bao. So when they were alive, they did not believe in the importance of merit cultivation. Xiu fu, tu fu. They did not see the 
the usefulness of compassion, of helping other people, loving kindness, helping one another, right? They only live to serve themselves for their own uh, personal gain. So they live carelessly without regards for consequences. They, they don't care about the, the bad karma that they're doing will bring them consequences. So this kind of living is, uh, we, we could say, uh, lacking intelligence and wisdom. So just because that a person does not believe in the law of cause and effect, consequences, merit cultivation, it doesn't mean that there are no consequences. And whether in the physical world that we live in now, or the spirit world after we pass away, merit is the universal currency. Merit is like money. You can exchange money for the things you need. When you have money, you can use money to buy uh, your car so you can get around. You can buy food to feed your stomach. You can buy clothes to keep yourself warm. And likewise, when you have merit, you have the ability to exchange your um, for the things that you need to help you overcome difficulties. So there, there is a relationship between wealth and merit, right? Wealth, money, and merits like food, uh, food bao. So there is a correlation between being wealthy and cultivating merits. It's only that when we have merit, can we have wealth? With wealth, for example, you can afford to, um, to uh, afford good health care to take care of your body. And so there is a feedback loop that when you have merit, there's wealth. And with wealth, it allows you to generate more merit. And so to live in this world, we, we have to really pay back to life for sustaining our living, right? We, there, are, there is security when we live uh, in this environment. There's security. We don't have to worry about our homes being robbed, right? There's security. There's police. There's security. And when we want to go somewhere, we, somebody um, has manufactured cars, and now we have cars to drive. So there are so many conveniences that our lives depend on. And so we have to do something to earn those conveniences, to pay back those conveniences. So it, a person focuses only on making money without cultivating merits, without thinking about paying back, then that's not good. Uh, if a person is busy making money and at the same time cultivating merits, helping people, donating and all that, it's perfect. That person is uh, what you call has wisdom because that person allows the, uh, the merits to grow even more. But you have $10, for example, and instead of spending all $10, you take maybe $5 and you reinvest, allow that $5 to continue to grow. And then this way you don't run out. But if you have $10 and you spend all $10, then you have no capital for you to invest for future growth. A person who has a desire to help other people, but they lack resources to help the poor, for example, during uh, the cold winter, or to print out sutras, to distribute uh, Dharma texts, and they want to do that, but they don't have the ability to do so. They don't, maybe don't have the money or so to do so, then it's kind of pity. So we don't want to put ourselves in that situation where we run out of resources to, to help ourselves, to help others. Because once we have lost our momentum, it is very difficult to, to pick ourselves back up. When you are in a, a position of poverty, it is so difficult to give because you have no money to give. And because if you give money, you're going to hurt yourself. You've, you will not have money to feed yourself. So we don't ever want to put ourselves in that situation where we run out of resources when we want to help people. There is a correlation between money and merit. But money comes from merit. Right? And merit can help us to generate, uh, money can help us to generate merit. People who don't understand the Dharma will not see the merit side because merit is invisible. Phuc bao, you cannot see phuc bao, uh, merit, phu bao, phu ke jian, right? 
but money people can see. And so when people see money, they, 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 they see the power of money, but they don't see the power of merit. Because when money, they, they can buy material to satisfy their needs. But money and material, um, when you buy something, you, can, you only satisfy a specific need that you have. And so that's all people see is money equals satisfaction. But they don't see the working behind why there are people with money to, um, to buy the things that they, they want or they need to satisfy their desires. So they don't, they don't see the merits behind that wealth. Without understanding that, they only see money and desire uh, fulfillment. So that will cause them to have a delusion because they, only, they can only see money and that causes rise to desire to, and then that, have a, um, for, that forms attachment and they will do unskillful deeds to acquire um, the, uh, the things that, that they want. But they don't understand that if you want to have something, you need to have merit. And in order to have merit, you have to cultivate merit. You have to generate chiufu. You have to do food. So a person who does not see, understand the principle can only see money and not merit, right? But when we understand the principles, we understand that what allows us to have wealth money is merit, merit cultivation. So that means that we go and help people, we don't cheat people. People who don't understand that will see that the only way I can acquire money is to cheat people. Uh, let's say a person in construction uh, remodeling a home. And because it's so competitive, right? There's so many maybe contractors out there trying to, um, trying to win the business. And if a person, let's say you want to win a business, you have to lower your price so that, this, so that your offering is more attractive. So one trick that maybe a contract would do is they'll give you a very low price to, let's say, remodel your, your roof. They say, yes, I'll give you uh, uh, the best price, lower, lower than anybody. And so, well, if that's put too low, then how are they going to make money, right? So what, w one trick is that they'll give you, and then you sign a contract, and then when they start removing the shingles from the roof, they say, oh, this needs to be fixed. That needs to be fixed. And so they start adding up those expenses. Uh, maybe unnecessary, and, and maybe we don't know much about construction. And so they'll, they say, well, this is danger. Um, this is very dangerous. You don't fix it. It's hazardous. So then what you do, you have to fix it if, to avoid that, that uh, danger. So perhaps, it, perhaps it's necessary to fix those things. Uh, maybe not, but if they are an ethical, a contractor, an, et an ethical, then they'll find ways to make you to pay to fix something that you don't need. Or you bring in your car, they say, oh, now your oil is leaking, right? This is broken. This needs to be fixed. The gasket is broken. Uh, you drive this, it's going to be very dangerous, so you have to fix it. And so. So a person who does not understand the principle, that understand the Dharma, they don't understand the, how to cultivate merit. They can only see that one, the only way to earn money is to trick people. But a person who understands the principle, then they will see that the only way to earn money, to earn wealth, to have wealth, is to do good deeds, to help people, to donate. So that's the proper way, right? What they don't know is, is that money, can, when you buy something very specific, it only satisfies the specific needs. For example, food, or let's say a, 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 a thief go into the house and he sees 50 pounds uh, bag of rice. He's not gonna steal the 50 pounds bag of rice. He's probably gonna steal money <laughs> because if he were to steal that 50 pounds bag of rice, who have to carry with him is, is, is heavy. And the only thing he can do with that is to eat it. Right? The only thing he can do is to fill his um, empty stomach. 
he can wear it, he can decorate himself, he can he cannot use it to drive around. But if he was to steal money, then money could convert, could, could buy other things. So once you have turned into materials, it only satisfies specific needs. Like a drink can only satisfy your thirst. Your clothes can only help to keep you warm. You cannot eat your clothes, right? But money is more versatile, meaning you can buy more things. But merit is even more versatile. Versatile would merit with fu bao, fu bao. Not only can you buy, uh, can you have wealth, but you can also have health. You can also have beauty. So merit is more versatile. It allows you to have more. And when you have only money, the that range, that versatility re is reduced. And when you have material, it now is only very specific, right? So merits are more versatile. So a person who is wise will cultivate merits because it merits allows that person to, to have many choices. Because when you have money, you cannot buy everything. Money cannot buy good health, right? When you're sick and you have a lot of money, it cannot buy you good health. It may buy you a comfortable bed, right? seven thousand dollar bed that you can buy or ten thousand whatever you know and you can buy the services for conveniences you can buy the whole hospital with all the staff to take care of you but you cannot buy good health right money cannot buy friendship buy trust you want somebody who who you can trust who will be there when you need them that friendship you cannot use money to buy but with merits, with compassion, you can have those things. When you help people, naturally people will help you back. And so that help is, I mean, comes from merits, not from money. You, you cannot buy um, friendship with money. Although I've read a story um, from a news article in Japan, people are growing older and Jap Japanese, they don't, um, I guess the young uh, people uh, focus about a career and, of course, economic uncertainties. They don't have a lot of children. And so the, the young children, uh, the birth rate is much lower, but people are living longer. And so when they live longer, they, they need support. They need people to talk to. The, uh, um, you know, the friendship is important to their, um, to their well-being. So there are services out there that you could rent a wife or a husband or a brother, and that person will um, will act like your wife or your husband, and to bring back the memories that you used to um, have with your spouse. is so when they have those services, that let's say you're older now and your wife or your husband has passed away, and you could call up the number and say. No, for that service, and that person will come and dress as much as close as possible and act like as if your wife was alive or your husband was alive. So you can buy friendship, but maybe, but then you know it's not really real. Right? It's just on the surface. So merits are more versatile because with merits, with fu bao, fu bao, let's say. With merits, you have strong, good, strong body, good health, and with, with good health, you can work hard, right? And you make money, you earning, and then you can have your wealth, and you can have a good life. With merits, opportunities open to you, and you have this lucrative deal to make a lot of money, right? And you become wealthy. You have a lot of money, you become wealthy, and now you can have access to good health, good health care. Right? You have um, a, a good doctors taking care of you. And with merits, let's say you know how to socialize, you know how to make deals with people, and, and you, can find, um, you can find people to invest in you, to give you money to do something, to open a business. People invest in you. And so with merits, um, with merits you are born to a wealthy family, and because of your positions, your credibility of your family, that people uh, can trust you easily, right? If you are, you're driving Mercedes, 
know, um, to a business uh, meeting, they are more likely to trust you than driving a broken Honda, <laughs> right? People are not going to be very likely to trust. But if you were born in a, uh, you're born in a wealthy family and your family is credible, people are likely to trust you, to invest in you, and therefore you can make money as well. So, so merits allows you to have so many things, good health, or good education, you know, wealth, and so forth. Right? But the law of conditionality, Pháp Yung Khởi, Yuan Chi Fa, so it's more than what you, uh, you, you reap, what you sow, meaning you plant trong cái nào được quả đấy, quả nấy đó. It's more than that, because that's very fixed. But the law of conditionality, Pháp Yung Khởi, Yuan Chi Fa, it's very dynamic. It's very, very dynamic. It's not a fixed formula. You plant a seed, you get a fruit. It's more than that. For example, when you donate money, it does not necessarily bring you wealth. For example, people who uh, know how to plant trees, they will appreciate this. So when you plant an orange, a seed orange, and you have an orange tree, you, and then you add, you gaff, when you join the two branch, uh, branches together, you do grafting, you get, uh, let's say, orange with pomelo, you get grapefruit. When you plant orange and uh, with the orange seeds, you may get grapefruit. And you don't necessarily get oranges. So, and then today, you know, we have this genetic modifications, right? They're changing the genetic characteristics of the, the fruits of the crops. And so, to say that when you plant a pepper seed, you get pepper, or you plant an apple seed, you get apples. It does not fully describe the uh, law of conditionality. Because, so it's, it's not that, the law of the conditionality is not that simple. So a person who quoted merits, for example, a person who quoted merits to help people by providing medicines or uh, healthcare services uh, like acupuncture, for example, and they hope that person will recover soon, uh, the, the, the patients will recover soon. But if he leaves alone, then yes, he could bring him good health as a result to, um, uh, for his karmic rewards. But if that person, let's say that I'm helping, I'm giving people medicine to be healthy, and, but then I want something else, I want to be beautiful, then that person is now doing generic modification of that karmic seed, right? Just like this here, you plant a, um, an, orange, um, an orange seed, but then in that tree you graft it, you put the pomelo branch and you tie together, the result is what? Grapefruit. So just like so, when we give people medicine, and but we have the intentions of being beautiful, then you are changing, right? You are changing that the, um, the 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 fruition of your karmic seed. So I thought when whenever we do something and we have the intentions of something else, we are changing our karmic seed. We are changing. The law of cause and effect. I mean, you don't change the law of cause and effect, but you change the effect from it. If a person who say, "I, I want to be, um, I want to help others, I want to, you know, make people happy," may I have the benefits of being beautiful in the next lifetime? Yes, you can, it's possible. Right, you're helping people to be ha happy, to be healthy, but then the result is not health, but it's beauty. So you, you're changing that. So it is possible. So the law of conditionality is very dynamic. Uh, for example, in the Earth Store, um, Earth Store um, Bodhisattva Sutra, right? It says here is that um, where the Earth Store Bodhisattva asked Shakyamuni Shakyam Buddha about the the result of giving. And he said, 
um, 地藏经啊、um, 跟别的讲。Is that that a person may encounter Buddhist stupas like a temple? 叫 Buddha stupas, monasteries, temples, or images of Buddhas, Bodhisattvas.、Uh, here is Tanvang, Shengwen, uh, uh, and、um, Pratyaka Buddhas is、um, a private Buddha,、um, like Bhajifa. If you make offerings, then you could serve because of that offerings that the results that you could serve as a lower chakra. Um, for the duration of three eons, three baki, so you can be a, a heaven king for three eons, and you're enjoying the bliss. But if you were to transfer the blessings dedicating to the Dharma realm, pháp giới, pháp giới, then you will you're now changing to a different level of heaven. Now you are not a Brahma king. Can, um, uh, Uh, the uh, great Brahma heaven king for ten eons, and so, so those who themselves encourage others、uh, to do good deeds, they themselves already do good deeds, and they encourage others to do good deeds. They become the wheel turning、uh, kings of Chuyen Lung, Chuyen Lung, Lung Fa Fu, for hundreds of thousands of lives, successive lives, and if they were to me- dedicate merits. To enlightenment, then they will come become Buddha. And say, let's say here、um, in the sutras that by providing like medicines, food and drinks, you could become a,、uh, a lord, a, a king in the heaven, pure dwelling heavens. And you could also become lords of six desire heavens,、um, and then eventually Buddhahood. So when we do something, just giving, but one giving. Leads you to become a heaven king. The other, the result when you have that intentions of enlightenment, yango, ah, jie wu, then you can attain Buddhahood, become a Buddha. So it's not that when you give something you get wealth, but because your intention, you dedicate the merits to enlightenment, then it leads you to Buddhahood. Right. So you plant an apple tr- seed. Doesn't mean that you will get ap- apples. You may get other fruits, right? When you give, it doesn't mean that you're going to have wealth, but you could have enlightenment. You could become a Buddha. So here,、uh, the Buddha says to、uh, Earth Star Bodhisattvas: Good man and woman may plant good roots in the、uh, Buddha Dharma by giving, repairing stupas, repairing temples. If they tr- transfer their merits to the Dharma realm, then they enjoy,、um, you know, it is much more. But if they were to dedicate their merits, hồi hướng công phước báo đó, only to the f- immediate extended families, the small circle, then it is for their own personal gain, and so the rewards will just be three lives of happiness, as opposed to you were, if supposed to dedicating merits to all sentient beings or the、uh, Dharma realm. Uh, five years, then they enjoy it, it more, right?、Uh, because it multiplies. So here it says that by giving up one, ten thousand folds reward is obtained. And so you can multiply, you can change it, just like a corn. A corn is could be destroyed by cold weather, but scientists use genetic modification to make the corns very strong, could survive a very cold winter. Or flood and and things like that and and so you can even grow crops in water, a flooded area, and so they have found ways to allow countries to grow crops in floods because without dry land is very difficult to grow, but because of genetic modifications that they can grow and make the crops survive longer. So same thing here that when we do something and we have the intentions of Something else, we are changing it. If we we give a donation to charity, but we want to have that gain for ourselves, then it is very small,、um, small fruit. But we want to share with other people, then that tree grows many fruits and big fruits, right? 
So just like in our Pure Land method, um, right? uh, Jingtu, a person who chants Amitabha, and Amitabha has 48, 48 great vows to escort them to the Western Pure Land. Sukhavati, Kuglateya, Jila But if the practitioner, practitioner says um, that I wish to be beautiful in the next life, or I chant Amitabha so that my son can pass an exam, a final exam, or I chant Amitabha so that my bus business will grow, will not suffer. And yes, so you, Amitabha has the vow to escort you to go to the Western Pure Land. But you say, I don't want it. I only want beauty. I only want business prosperity. I only want money. Then you are changing, right? You're modifying that cost to something else. So the, the, the seed, uh, tử, the seed, uh, zi, is chanting Amitofo, Amitabha. But the result, the fruit, is complete, can be completely different. So just because you chant Amitabha doesn't mean you're going to go to Western Pure Land. Because when we chant Amitabha, our thinking, our vong tưởng, wang xiang, we want to have something else. And so therefore, we're not going to arrive at um, the Western Pure Land. Because our thinking is different. Because in the chanting of Amitabha, we only want to have beauty. We only want to have money. We only want to have beautiful family. And therefore, the result is that when it comes, when the conditions are right, you will have money, you will have beautiful family, but no Western Pure Land. <laughs> right. So you have 10 people giving money to a charity donation. So same giving, right? They, they can give the same amount, even. Everybody, 10 people, everybody, $100, right? Did we, and sometimes we encourage others. In a disasters, we, we ask other people, hey, we have this cost here. We want to raise some money. Can you please contribute some? And OK, I'll give you $100. OK, I'll, I'll see you $100. I'll give you $100. So 10 people giving the same $100. But in the next lifetime, when the fruition come, when it comes, then some people are, are little rich. Some people are super rich. So it's, they're different because of the intention. Maybe one person uh, gave originally was to just to gain some fame. Say, I want to be known as donor of this cause. And so when it, it was for personal gain, they didn't want to have wealth. They only want to have fame. They want to be recognized. Right? They didn't want to, the, the intention was not to help people, but the intention to give was to have that fame. And so therefore, they were, they're changing the giving. But a person who gave originally, another person who gave originally, wanted to truly help the poor. And so that pure intention will, is much bigger uh, of a result when it comes to fruition. So the same karmic seed of charity giving, right? Um, charity giving, right? but the results are different. So as, as we discuss in the, the Earth Store Bodhisattva Sutra, you can see that same giving, same seed, but you can grow into a different fruit. Right? So, and the results are different because the intentions are different. When we chant Amitabha and we want to have good health, then we're going to have good health and not the Western Pure Land. Right? You can have merit um, cultivations, giving, and you can either have wealth, you can have beauty, uh, and, and so forth. Or you can even have enlightenment, right? become a Buddha. When we chant Amitabha, those who practice the uh, Pure Land method, when Chen and Mitabha, they should understand the criteria. How is it that one can go to the Western Pure Land? It's not about donating how much money you have. And it's even more than just chanting Amitabha. So that criteria that Hui Zhang, Hui Zhang, Hui Zhang, 
has reminded us that the cost, the, the criteria, what's, what do we have to do? The basic requirement is right? we have to be very happy to want to go there. We have, we have to be very happy in chanting, um, being mindful of Amitabha. And so therefore, your intention is to be there. Therefore, naturally, naturally, you want to be there. If you don't want to be there, then you're not going to be there. Given the options, you're not going to be where you don't want to be. So we should understand that the law of cause and effect, uh, and the law of conditionality is very dynamic. Right? It's not you plant something, you get something. It's not always. So there, and there are different levels of um, merit cultivation. Some people perform merit cultivation for like a charity donation, char uh, ch um, donation to a charity. They, the personal gain, right? They dedicate their lives, to, uh, their merits to themselves and family. So there will be comic rewards, and but it's short durations, maybe in the human realm. Uh, next level up is impersonal, where that donation uh, that they dedicate their merits to all sentient beings through the four immeasurables. And because of that, that they have longer durations of karmic rewards and conveniences, perhaps in the human and the heaven realm. And then a level higher than that is transcendental, where when they make that um, um, donations, they dedicate their merits to enlightenment, yekno, jiewu. And that, uh, that leads them to liberation from samsara, right? the cycle of life and death, and eventually to Buddhahood. So we, we, there are different levels of giving, and we should understand the importance of uh, merit cultivation. And we should understand why it doesn't mean that you don't you don't chant like for pure land practitioners you don't chant you stop chanting Amitabha and you go out and you 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 help people and you donate and that's not what I mean here but I have an excerpt here to um, to kind of help to understand our purpose and of course this is for your considerations and personal interpretation because this is so difficult to give a a cookie cutter answer everybody is different. But we should understand the purpose of, of what we do in our cultivation, right? the purpose of why we, we cultivate. So in his book, uh, Shankara Sita, he mentions about the book that he was reading by Enoch Powell called No Easy Answers. So in, in this book, uh, Powell um, was a, a Christian. He, had a, a belief that uh, from a uh, traditional conservative in his thinking and he says that um, that Christians who should really ought to be um, sh should really be uh, Christians and not out be out there doing uh, work on race relations and social improvement and he says that uh, those who are good Christians um, should be concerned with salvations for their own soul and getting to the kingdom of heaven. So to him, the purpose of being a Christian is to be with God, to go and be with, with God. And, and, that, and that they should not be concerned with social service. So of course, this uncompromising view anger many uh, Christians who were socially minded, right? He did not like uh, what Paul was saying. But Shankara, he's just saying, well, you look at it a different way. Whatever you're doing, what is the purpose of your, you know, your, your activity? He said that if you were a Buddhist, what is the purpose of being a Buddhist and practicing? Oh, he said, and, and that you must not be deflected from the main thing by other things. You should not be distracted. He said, uh, he said that although good in themselves in 
from a social point of view to perform um, uh, sh uh, social services, for example. And but that's not the main the main thing, right? Giving all that is just um, is secondary. Uh, and of course, this is his view, right? He said that um, there are people who have said to his order, his um, uh, his sangha, that why aren't they out helping people, raising money for beggars, you know, building shelters for the homeless? Well, he said, well, all these things are good, but they are not the main thing. So the main thing is the development of a higher state of consciousness. If you can help others too, so much the better. But that's not the main thing. So that's what Sangha Shita is saying. But we should, we should not take this literally. We should understand what this means. I mean, if you take a look, take take a step back. If you want to save the world, you have to ha have the criteria. You gotta be qualified to do that kind of work, right? If, but but if a person who has not ended greed, anger, and delusions, the more that that person interacts with the world, the more afflictions will arise. Right? Greed, anger, delusion, tam sen si, tan zhen si. So Buddha, a big goal of the outlook, but it doesn't mean that you study Buddhism for your own salvation. But you first have to make sure that you want to save the world, you, you need to make sure, right, as it's said here, that you are qualified to do so. Uh, and so here it says, Powell quotes a horrible statement by trade union Christians who said that Christians really ought to be doing is attending meetings, not going to churches. <laughs> of course, after some debate, the man realized um, was shocked and he said okay well i changed my view um he withdrew his statement and apologized he said attending trade unions uh was only equally important to attending holy communion churches not more <laughs> important so the takeaway here is what is our goal because there's so much that the world needs and if we want to save the world we have to ask ourselves what is it that we need and so the we have, we have to ask ourselves, do we understand the purpose of our, what is it that we're trying to achieve and not be distracted? And are we true to ourselves in ending our own afflictions? I feel now, fun now. Are, are we really ending our afflictions? Greed, anger, delusion, tan zhen si, uh, tam sang si. And is our motivation is to help others or to help ourselves? Right. If you are just a, a student and you want to be the CEO of a company, of a, a CEO of a company, and if that let's say that the company now gives you that responsibility without ed proper education, without the experiences, you're gonna bring down that company. You're gonna corrupt. I mean, you're gonna destroy that company because you don't understand the business strategy. Right. So maybe it's better for that student to go to school to have um, work experiences to build up as opposed to becoming a CEO right away. So I think the takeaway here is we have to understand our intentions, our purpose, and that we don't be dis we don't get distracted by other things. Let's say right now right we have hurricanes in the east, fires in California, floods in the mid um, West and so forth, typhoons, uh, a lot of destruction, a lot of suffering, and and if we don't we don't know how to control ourselves, we could get get wrapped up in the emotional um, stirred up because we see a lot of people suffering and we don't know how to control ourselves, then we're gonna cry with them and we don't we cannot help them. Of course, it doesn't mean that we don't help. We help whatever we can, but at the same time, we should understand the higher goal. Because once we become successful in our cultivation, let's say we obtain enlightenment, we are bodhisattvas now, a Buddha, we can help more people. 
And so we, so this is again for your interpretation. Everybody, everybody's situation is unique. Some people are more capable in helping others. Some people are not as capable. But her whole point is not to cause more afflictions, fun now, feeling now, in ourselves, but to eliminate them. And so if you were to have a choice between go out there to give, to help people, and to eliminate selfishness, greed, it is probably more useful to eliminate own greed. Because if we don't eliminate our own greed and we go out to help people, we are searching, seeking for the gains, our personal gain, to maybe for fame, for even even not for fame, but for future karmic rewards. Phuc bao, right? We're there to seek phuc bao, phu, uh, phu bao, or merits. But we should we should understand that when we st study Buddhism, the the point, the purpose of attaining Buddhahood is to help others. And not escapism. We don't escape. And and so we should understand this very clearly. That sometimes you you, you have to um, know your own situation. There are people who are well; they can go out to help people. Let's say in the COVID. But if just you yourself are contracted with the virus, it's probably best to isolate yourself. Get well, if you were to go out and help people, you may infect other people, right? So we have to understand our own situation. Are we in a situation where we can help people and bring more benefits? Yes, if you were contracted with a virus, you may help to bring in foods, for example, and they may have a meal. But then at the end of the meal, after they with a full stomach, they all get sick <laughs> because of the virus that we spread. So we have to sometimes take a step back and look at the, the total picture. Are we bringing benefits? to the mass, the group, or are we hurting the group, right? So Buddhism is not escapism. And so let's talk about escapism, escapism because this seems to be a, a common misunderstanding of Buddhism. And um, this section here, Shankar Sita um, extracted a, an, a, um, an analogy from the uh, White Lotus Sutra. Um, uh, where there was this house, a burning house, and the, the, the father wants all the children to, you know, to leave the burning house. So some people might say that, say, well, Buddhism is about leaving, about escaping, about leaving this world. Yeah, yeah I talk, yeah, I talk, right? To be uh, not caring about this world. And so, so what does this parable mean? What does this story mean? How, what does it teach us about escapism? And he says that a lot of people would say that very typical that religions encourage people to run away from the problems of the world, right? They just want to meditate all day. They don't care about the world. They just want to chant Amitabha all day without the world. Or they, they just want to absorb in their own religions. And they don't care about um, other people's problem and they don't even worry about their own problems meaning that they ignore it. the bills come they don't care about the bills right they just want to meditate absorbed in meditative bliss and so they would say that well look at the Buddha right leaving his wife and his child right ducking out of his uh, responsibilities and obligations right not staying back to help his father to rule the country but to go into the forest so that he could be liberated into nirvana. So they would criticize to say that Buddha is just sits around meditating, ignoring the sins and suffering all around them. Pure escapism. But we should understand, but in Sankar Siddha says, well, it's escape morally wrong. Let's say that you are in a, literally in a burning house. Let's say this building right now is burning. Is it wrong that you want to go out of this house for your own, your own safety, right? And if you were, let's say, upstairs, uh, um, surrounded by smoke and flames, and you want to escape, what your friend says afterward, you shouldn't have done that. Why do you jump out? Why do you escape <laughs> that burning house, <laughs> right? So, 
So Buddhism sees our situation as one of pain and suffering. So Buddha, Buddhism, um, from a very uh, on the surface, sees this world as not very satisfactory. So we have to get out now, right? So, but maybe the word here says the word escape is maybe a wrong word to use, because traditionally the um, the word means to gain one's liberty by flight. You escape, you flight to gain liberty to get out safely. And but then there is a new meaning of a uh, new usage of this is that escapism now is it sounds very negative, where it means a, a mental emotional distraction from realities of life. You want to escape, you want to ignore it. So that's, that's, it has taken on a new meaning, that word. And, and that is you know, the notion, the idea of escapism, just seeking distractions. So like in the burning house parable, the story, the burning house, um, I mean, it's a predicament that we find ourselves here. We, we have this suffering. But do you want to stay in the suffering? And to suffer with the others, or to find higher ground to help yourself and help others. It would perhaps be better to speak of transcending this human predicament rather than escaping from it. So, jie tuo or yai tuo is not to escape, to run away from a problem, but to transcend it, to move on to a different level, to move on that conflict. Right? Um, and so the parable is showing us how we can transcend us and our present state, move on beyond our present state from a lower, less satisfactory state of existence to a higher and more satisfactory state. For example, let's say you're at a job, 15, 20 years, you're very dedicated, and you want to move on, let's say, to, to study um, because of promotion. Well, is that so bad that you leave your current job for a promotion to grow, to develop? And so, or if you are, uh, if a person's in an abusive relationship, is it bad that the person wants to move on from that abusive relationship, right? So, so escapism here is, I mean, has the, that kind of negative connotation, uh, meaning. But of course, it's not to say that there is no such thing as escapism. We need to understand that what escapism really is. What is, what is escapism? And, and what is it that we're trying to escape from, run away from? So when we try to avoid these situations that demand that we go beyond ourselves, and we forget our human predicament, and we try to secure an easy life, then that is really escapism. Let's say that people need help, but you don't want to bother. You just want to meditate all day, or chant Amitabha all day, and don't care about it. And you just, because you feel so wonderful, then that is escapism, right? A job uh, at work needs you to, let's say, come uh, on the weekends to do something to help complete the project, but you rather go to uh, a, um, a Dhamma assembly, Pháp Hoi, Phá Hoi, to, to show, you know, to be with your friends, uh, because it's much more enjoying than to be at work, then that is escapism. So when we have responsibility, that's what Shankar Shita is saying, that when we have responsibilities and we choose to ignore them, then that is escapism. We are being distracted by something else. We don't want to face reality. That is escapism. So the meaning of escapism here is stagnation. We're not growing. And even regression, toi jing, toi juan. Right? We're not growing. That is escapism. And it, when we do something, and we just lip service, no, pro, uh, no progress, no personal change. Lip service, like you say, it's, it's very good to chant Amitabha or something like that, but you yourself don't believe in it. Or well, it's good to practice Buddhism, but you yourself don't practice. So that, you know, that is um, lip service, and that is escapism. And, but he it says that nowadays it's less involved in religion of any kind, because people don't believe as much 
in religion uh, in the traditional sense, um, like before. Nowadays, there are non-religious activities to provide outlets for escapism. Right? People use work uh, for escapism. Politics are escapism. Even arts, where people are so workaholic that they don't want to leave work because it's more, it's better for them to be at work than to be at home taking care of the kids or cooking, um, to cooking uh, for the family. Um, I remember a funny story that um, my coworker mentions that there was this guy who would intentionally go um, home late. Yeah, he from work because because in his family, whoever goes home early, we have to cook dinner, <laughs> right? So he intentionally, uh, he would go home late to avoid cooking dinner for the family. <laughs> and arts, people would, would you know, they would be absorbed in arts and not care about anything else. That's escapism. Reading is escapism. Watching television is escapism. Sex is escapism, right? People are, when, we, when people are distracted from reality, from the responsibilities at hand, that is escapism. So any kind of life that involves no positive, deliberate effort to evolve is escapism. When we're not growing, we're not advancing, that's escapism because we'd rather be absorbed by doing something else than to, to face reality and to grow. So if you think about that, then escapism is the rule rather than exception, meaning that just because you study Buddhism doesn't mean you are escapist. Right? So escapism is, can be in the world too. People who are not performing their re, uh, perf um, responsibilities, they are escapists as well. So the parable of the burning house teaches us that we have to go beyond our personal level and look towards growth, development, and evolution. So today the burning house is burning more than ever, right? With a lot of disasters. So the whole questions of transcendence, growth, and development to a higher state, higher consciousness becomes more urgent than ever. People are suffering, and there's a lot of problems. But in Buddhism, when you understand, you don't see, you, you may have pain, but no suffering. But people in the world, there are both pain and suffering. When we understand the law of conditionality, when our car is broken down, we don't have suffering. But if we don't understand the law of conditionality, conditionality to understand the Dharma, then when our car is broken down, there is suffering. You get angry, right? you get upset. Um, when things don't go right, if we don't understand the law of conditionality, then we get, uh, we have suffering. And so what he's saying here is that really the world now need, uh, nowadays needs a way to alleviate suffering. Pain will continue to be there, but suffering can stop. That's the importance of studying Buddhism is allows you to overcome suffering. And so there's no need to despair, don't worry about it. Always darkest before dawn. And potentially, we'll come to a point where maybe the whole world will have a one single world community, right? A single human culture, which all existing cultures will contribute the best. Maybe enlightenment is the goal for every human individual to overcome our own suffering. And of course, it will not happen automatically. We have to put in the efforts to, to, to do that. And so we have to pre, uh, transcend the human predicament, um, meaning that we have to don't be poor either way. Understand your own situations. If you have ability to help, then you should help. Responsibilities that we have, we should meet them. We should not escape from them. Right? So studying Buddhism is not escapism. And because the purpose of attaining Buddhahood is to help others, we have to first understand our own situation. What we're saying here is that 
uh, we understand the law of cause and effect, the law of conditionality, that is more than just planting an apple seed, we will get apples. Depends on ten intention that we get something else. All right? Does it make sense? Okay. So there are two kinds of merit cultivation. One is, I'll call it worldly, hu lao, wu, uh, you lo. And then the other kind is vo lao, or wu lao. Um, the worldly is, um, is kind of like a, a, a leaking bucket, right? There are holes, and when you put more water, it just drains away. It doesn't retain. Whereas the other kind, the bucket is full, where you put in it and it, can, it continues to, to be there. So what this means is when we cultivate merits, we should understand are we cultivating the worldly kind of merits or the unworldly? The worldly, so the difference is that the worldly will lead to joy and, and wealth and all that, but it will lead to unsatisfactoriness, cool or cold. Uh, doesn't mean, it's not necessarily suffering, but you become unsatisfied because because it doesn't last. And in this case, you will have both pain and suffering. You don't know how to you know, deal with it. But for the unworldly kind, where it's more like the ngip, you know, and vo ngia, jing ye and wu wo, kind of um, non egoistic kind of um, merit cultivation. And where it leads to in, um, enlightenment and is, is lasting. So when I say un lasting and unlimited, I don't mean in terms of amount. When we have unlimited merits, doesn't mean that you are rich forever I don't, or you are young forever. That's not what I mean. Unlimited here means that you are, you are, you are, you can transcend that suffering where there is, it doesn't. It doesn't make you suffer anymore. For example, we have this body. We all grow old. This body is 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 worldly. Now, this healthy body is worldly merits, karmic rewards that we have. But a person who has unlimited merit will not have suffering. The body will grow old. You will have pain, but you don't have suffering. So when you cultivate. Uh, then there is no end, meaning that whatever you have stays with you. For example, like when we give with the worldly giving, right? The worldly giving, you will have this beautiful body, this healthy body, but then eventually this body will will grow old, will die. You cannot enjoy it anymore. So it comes to an end. So that's worldly um, merit. It doesn't last. The other one is unworldly is like your, your wisdom, your ability to transcend suffering. That is unworldly. Does it make sense? One is that allows you to have, in fact, the more you use it, the more you have. The more you experience things with wisdom, you have more wisdom, you have more experiences. So that's, that's why it's unlimited. So unlimited here mean, doesn't mean unlimited amount, physical amount. But unlimited means that it, it can, it, it's, it's independent of this, the conditions. When you grow old, your old age doesn't bother you. Right, you when you have pain, you are you, you have a knee knee pain. You cannot walk. It doesn't bother you. So your happiness is unlimited because it's not depending on anything. But if we were to have the worldly merits, where we are happy because we are popular, we're young, we're beautiful, and people like us, we have friends, and our happiness relies on those situations then it's limited. Does that make sense? We have two choices. One is limited and the other one's unlimited. Limited is because there is egoistic. 
Bangya, right? Ji uh, Wu, because there is a Wu Zi in it, um, self attachment in it, and therefore it's limited. So when you when you help somebody, it can be limited or unlimited. When you help somebody so that you gain merit, gain Fu Bao, Fu Bao, then that is limited because you will be wealthy, but then you cannot live forever to enjoy your wealth. So that will come to an end, whether you like it or not. On the other hand, when you help somebody, you encourage them, let's say the law of cause and effect, to understand, to live morally, to help other people. Then that is unlimited because, because they can help more people. And that you gain wisdom, that you are not attached. And so your happiness or your, is, is not depending on that person listening to you or helping you. But you're happy because you're, you're beyond that. That's why it's unlimited, the like volume. Yeah. Wu Liang. So Wu Liang or volume doesn't mean a lot, but it's beyond that. Does it make sense? So when we say, well, in Buddhism, when we say inf infinity, infinite, or Bo Leung, or Wu Liang, it doesn't mean amount. Yeah, like infinite time, it doesn't mean amount, it doesn't mean that it lasts for a long time, but it's beyond that. When you understand the Dharma, your joy is infinite because you're no longer depending on your money, the good weather for happiness. Wherever you are, you are happy because it's infinite, does it make sense? Right? So infinite doesn't mean you have a lot of money. Doesn't, infinite doesn't mean you are young forever. But that joy is infinite because you are above all those things. Right? They don't make you feel happy, but you decide to be happy. Right? You walk into a room and there are angry people looking at you. <laughs> All right? But it does not impact you because your happiness is infinite. But you walk into a room and people compliment you and you're happy, then that is not infinite. That's limited. Because the moment that they stop complimenting you, your joy uh, uh, decreases. And therefore, it's limited. So whenever that, whenever something that resi uh, relies on external criteria, and it's always limited, and so infinity, volume, wuliang, is beyond that because it's no longer um, dependent on anything to, to grow it or to deplete it even. Right? So when we cultivate merits, we should ask ourselves, are we cultivating worldly merits, limited merits or unlimited? Right? Okay. When we help somebody, our merits, why are they, why are our merits limited? Why is it that we cannot achieve unlimited? Well, there are a few things, because we want to enjoy our karma, our karmic rewards. Um, or, and then we stop worrying about the world, because when we have fu bao, fu bao merits, it makes us desensitized to the hardships of others. We don't pay attention to the hardship, because every, the, because everywhere we see is, is so beautiful, right? That's the, the function um, of merit is that it, it removes all the hardships or we become wasteful when people who are rich, you know, they can whip out $100 in mindless entertainment without worry. But a person who doesn't have a lot of money, they have to be very careful in their spending. So sometimes, a person is poor, not because they don't give, but because they're being wasteful, right? And so, so that's why between giving and eliminating our greed, like tam, 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 and tan xin, between bu shi and tan xin, eliminating tan xin, between donating and eliminating our own greed, it is more important to eliminate our own greed. Because when you give and you are rich, 
but you don't eliminate your greed, you can become wasteful and you can deplete your own wealth. Right? So sometimes when a person is poor, not because they don't practice giving, but because they are wasteful. Right? And of course, seeking return for recipients, like you give, uh, you donate to an organization and you want to be recognized as a donor, then that's why it's limited, right? So, but of course, we should cultivate unlimited merits, not limited. So again, unlim unlimited doesn't mean, doesn't mean a lot of amount, a lot, but it goes beyond the amount, it goes beyond the criteria, I mean the conditions to generate, to impact it. So that's what infinity means, right? So, so again, let's review, we're um, coming to an end here. Merit is very versatile. It can give you health, it can give you wealth, it can give you beauty. And then from there, you can convert into whatever you want. So person who doesn't understand merit will chase after wealth with maybe an ethical uh, behavior, lying, cheating. Or a person who wants to be beauty, be, be beautiful, and they don't understand the Dharma, they, they change their face, they have um, plastic surgery to make them look good. But a person who understands the Dharma, they know that beauty comes from kind heart. You're kind to people, you are more attractive to other people. Right? So merit is more versatile, it can give you many things. And if we don't understand merit cultivation, well, when we try to acquire wealth or health, Often it leads to affliction, greed, anger, delusion, um, to acquire those things. And so as you also understand that the law of conditionality is very lively and dynamic. So it's not a fixed formula. Because you are planting a seed doesn't mean doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna get the fruit. If you were to do grafting, different intentions will change that, right? You chanamitaba, it doesn't mean that you're gonna go into Western Pure Land. If the intention is to have wealth or beauty, you change the course of it, right? So we should also um, practice non-egoistic um, you know, giving to avoid limited merits, because limited merits you enjoy, it doesn't last. With limited, mer uh, uh, limited merit, when you, have a beautiful, uh, when you have a beautiful body, it doesn't last. After 100 years, you cannot enjoy anymore. But with wisdom unlimited, even if you grow old, you still are beautiful, right? People still respect you because you have wisdom and you overcome, uh, you can easily transcend suffering. When you grow old, your bodies might ache, you may have arthritis, but you may have pain, but you don't have suffering, right? Dao mà không khổ, right? And so that's why um, what's encouraged here of us is to practice unlimited merits and to be non-egoistic and to, to practice living, uh, loving kindness and wisdom because those things will allow us to continue to grow. Does it make sense? Okay, okay we will do merit dedication. Okay, you could please join your palms together to re recite. May the merits and virtues accrue today, adorn the Buddha pure lands, repay four types of kindness above, and aid those suffering in the paths below. May those who see and hear of this bring forth the result for the body mind. When this retribution body is complete, Together we shall meet in the land of ultimate bliss. If you could please rise, and we bow to the Buddha three times to show our respect. First bow, second bow, and third bow. Ami Please stay back for lunch. <laughs>